All right. Start. Good afternoon and evening, everyone. Um, thanks for attending. Uh, this is so I'm just going to go through the disclaimer so we can begin our meeting. Uh, you attended this is the meeting of the International Model Stock Study Investment Club. Uh, it's a better investing model club open to the public. Our meetings are held on the third Mondays of each month at this time, so 5.30 Pacific, uh, 8.30 uh, Eastern, the exception being December when we meet on the second Monday of the month. Uh, all our meetings and our stock study studies are held online, allowing us to have members from across the world. Uh, our current members are from the United States, Canada, and China. Guests, as observers, you will be muted during the meeting and will have the opportunity for questions and comments once the meeting ends. Uh, any companies mentioned today are for educational purposes only and are not intended to be a recommendation for buying or selling any stocks. We ask that you conduct your own review and analysis of any company of interest before making an investment decision. This meeting may mention products or services not endorsed by Better Investing or the club. The views expressed are those of members and do not necessarily represent those of Better Investing. This meeting is also being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel for future reference and use. So. Today we will uh, we will be having an educational topic about discounted cash flow analysis from Matt. We'll go over a stock study analysis and then a couple of uh, annual reports as well as the PERT. Um, so at this point, I think we will turn it over to the treasurer for the report and portfolio review. Okay. So if I can send you the screen. Ready, you need to accept. Okay, there you go. Yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay, uh, good evening. Um, this is my first treasurer's report. I I put together a bunch of slides. I think is basic and essential information for the club members uh, once a month. Um, any suggestions uh, and changes, uh, I'd be glad to listen to you and uh, take the input and do. Um, improve for the next months. Uh, Ready, first one, yes. Ready, sorry to yeah. interrupt. I need to um, move your screen to more central. It's off. The um, PowerPoint is off. Yeah, move it. Move okay, it down. Okay. No, that's no. Not, not in the screen. Uh, I'm get to it. your other screen. Right now we see your way. inbox, right? Yeah, okay. Now we see your inbox, your email. Put it over your email. Huh? Put it in my email? We, we are looking at your email box right now. Oh, oh, oh. so uh, how do I change my screen? <laughs> can you put, right. can you pull that over? Pull that PowerPoint over on top of the email. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Yeah. Okay. Now move uh, that. Move that. Yeah. I, I, thought I, put, I, put, I thought I'm presenting on a bigger screen. Okay. Good. Uh, okay. Uh, this is my first set of slides. I went through the club portfolio um, in my iClub, and I thought this is the essential information as a first cut and uh, first time uh, I'm presenting. Any suggestions and improvements are welcome. I'll be glad to listen and discuss for the next month onwards. Okay, this first slide is the overall summary of uh, this month's activities. Um, since uh, May, um, I think 18th we had, 17th we had a meeting. And uh, this this slide summarizes all the activities. First, we sold Inogen at the 56 shares at this price on 17th. And um, the information, Background for Inogen is we bought $2,000 worth on June 16th, 2020, uh, almost a year ago, 11 months ago, and we gained 82% with a profit of $1,600 in 11 months. Then we sold Amazon 1.2, um, bought Amazon 1.25 shares, $4,000, and we bought eBay also $3,000 at this price. Um, the other part of the summary is uh, Tom Jones withdrew and we paid him off 
um, Jay will explain more details on this one. Uh, amount paid is listed here. And then we deposited about thousand dollars at this time. Uh, equal amounts on 16 members. Uh, that excludes the Tom Jones departing member. Uh, membership day uh, status has been updated in uh, my I club and there are several re changes and updates in the my I club please uh, view that at your time leisure uh, next is the this club portfolio heat map um, we used to show large um, a cash broker account you can see that that's all changed to cash a tiny box and the, the current cash position is $2,200 and uh, is a big change all because we paid out Tom and uh, club procedure for uh, enrolling members and paying out is changed. Um, the, this is the summary of the club portfolio. Uh, the, the cash balance situation is uh, last month we had $20,000 cash. Tom Jones paid out and the previous members were paid out um so that, that hence the reason for cash change uh, these are the standard slides for uh, uh, the club portfolio and the sectors diversification but one thing that you can see is uh, because cash positions has gone down you can see the different proportions of the sectors um i think uh, tom lopez may dis discuss more on what do we do with either increase the small percentage portfolios or um, they, get, they sell them but it's a good idea to have anywhere between two to five percent of the portfolio in each uh, stock okay ready uh, can i make a yes. suggestion can you put your slide in the present mode so we can see the full screen right uh, now how do, how do we do top, how do we do oh okay, okay. okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> now oh, we can wow. see. this is much better okay mm. okay um you can see that the the uh, previous one the broker was a large amount um, account it's all reduced to and now this is a true picture of uh, our uh, stock portfolio um, with the Facebook as the, probably the largest one Disney and uh, uh, IIPR so small ones are um, uh, Domino's Pizza and uh, I think uh, that's the only one which is the, uh, the FAF okay um, yeah, this okay how do i go to next slide just, now just click the um the arrow button to the down arrow down, down arrow. arrow button on your uh, keyboard on your keyboard or you can use the mouse to oh, scroll keyboard down. or just page down okay page okay. Down. okay okay i got it um shall i move this to somewhere else this one uh, no it's good good okay I move to other screen. Okay, uh, this is company standard company size diversification from I to my I club. Um, we have a mid uh, mid mid cap is good, and I think mega cap is good. Um, small cap is uh, generally they suggest about fifteen percent. We have about thirteen percent. Um, large cap may be smaller than what probably we need to. Okay. Um, What is what is the what is the button I should press now? Pay, pay, the down arrow. Down arrow where? Uh, I'm pressing down arrow. Okay, down. Nothing moving. Okay. Yep. Slow. Okay. This is just uh, I put two slides together. Um, the sector and uh, industry. These are standard slides from my iClub. Um, you can see that the the communication services we have a large. Uh, amount uh, maybe some something to think in the future to uh, reduce that amount so it's the largest sector uh, next is uh, club performance um, again we went through um, all the way from the beginning but I, I in, on this slide this is uh, from January to uh, current club performance we can see um one year return is actually um uh, six months return is uh, uh 17 percent whereas the vanguard and uh, we chose index total stock market index fund um very narrow choices of index funds available we chose these two uh, 
and uh, we are not uh, performing as good as the indices but um, in in lo little longer run for the life of the club we are doing okay one year we are doing okay three year we are doing uh, better and um, this is the uh, new index we added um, we again short term we are not doing good but in long term we are uh, in par with uh, um, indices this is the club member member ownership um, you can see that the member ownership has completely changed from the previous one we used to put a thousand dollars for one one person uh, we changed the equal distribution right from the beginning G will explain, J will explain more. Um, the, uh, that's why the recent members will show a small percentage ownership. Okay, so do do not worry about that. But that's a um, that's a procedure uh, being followed now. Uh, next is current portfolio gain or loss. Um, this is organized again according to the um, sorted according to the percentage gain. You can see Charles Schwab, we are doing very good, and Innovative Properties, we are doing really good. Um, these are short-term holdings, so we bought it uh, um, 11 months ago and uh, four or five months ago, and we had to watch these, but uh, the, this is a, is a uh, sorted according to the gain or loss, and we had to watch again the um, lower gain stocks more closely in the future. The next one is uh, club sold securities from the beginning of the club uh, inception 516 and um, these are the uh, these are the indices uh, but gain loss is uh, shown here we have a uh, one two three four five six seven eight nine about ten about half of them are for losses but uh, uh, which means that we have to um, watch them more closely in our current stocks portfolios mm. okay um, no, but actually that for the slide you look at the security that means the after sold that's the biogen have gained the 35 percent after we sold that stock so that's yes red box so that red we the, we need to have a further discussion on our um sell selling decisions this is just a slide that is flagging that there might have been chances where we should have held on to the stock versus sell, we sold prematurely. Yeah, this, we, we can use this slide for a, a rethinking that our sell decision was good or not good. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, next one is uh, I'm probably exceeding my time limit. This is the last slide. I updated these membership uh, assigned uh, assignments, uh, and uh, again the, I listed the who is linking their ssg into my i club um, so far only i think the three or four people i have linked it's a very easy procedure i sent uh, uh, instructions bi instructions to the club members before i myself forgot <laughs> but i did if, it and if it you, need, you need help i'll joanne will help you just let me know yeah the, the bi has a, a instruction set it's very simple. Okay. Okay. So now, this is my last slide. Any questions? Uh, I'll be glad. Okay. No, we'll, do, we'll do questions, I think, at the end. Um, so I think it's time so we can move on to give Matt enough time to give us the education topic. Uh, Matt's going to be, I think he's present. I see him there. Yes. Let me just flip you the screen. Okay. Thank you, sir. Can, can that link be resent? I don't, it doesn't sound familiar, linking the iClub to the SSG. Yeah, we can okay. resend it. Okay, thanks. All right, can you see the presentation? Yes, yes. we can. So, yes, we can. Okay, so discounted cash flow uh, is basically. I guess I would say one of the primary ways to value a company. So, or really any investment. So it's really just taking, um, if you pay money for something, you're going to get money back in the future. It tells you if it's a good deal or not. 
So based on an interest rate. And that's pretty much how it is. Um, this is how, you know, historically people have valued stocks and things like that. Um, Warren Buffett and all these kinds of people. So I'm just going to go over that a little bit and then we kind of play around with see what like interest rates do to it, uh, to values of stocks and things like that. Uh, at the end. So I think I have 20 minutes, so I will be done at five after. Uh, so anyway, cash flow analysis. There's three basic ways to value a company, like I was starting to say. Uh, one's the dividend discount model. So you take the present value of all the dividend payments and you figure out how much that's worth. Uh, so you do this with like really high dividend paying uh, companies and determine, you know, what's the lowest uh, or the most you would pay for it, right? And if it's below that value, then you would buy it. And if it's above it, then you would wait. Um, so that's one way that a lot of people do it, but this is really, really good for high paying dividend companies. Um, another way, and this is primarily what Better Investing does, is uh, comparable companies or uh, multiple valuations. So taking price to earnings, um, and kind of comparing it and saying, well, this is a good deal or it's, uh, you know, not a good deal. And then, you know, you would estimate future earnings growth like we do on an SSG. And then based on price to earnings multiples, we would determine if it's a good price or not a good price. But this is essentially what we do with better investing on the SSG. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly is the discounted cash flow, which is just the present value of the future cash flow. So this is close to net income or earnings per share, but it's not exactly the same. And I'll go over what some of those differences are. Any questions so far? Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right, so present value of money. We're gonna do, this is like uh, Econ 101 or something like that. So feel free to shout out. Would you rather have $1 today or $1 tomorrow or a year from now? Anybody? Now, now. You want it now? <laughs> yeah. You, you, yeah, you won, you won the prize. You want it today. You wanna to wait tomorrow, it'll be worth less tomorrow. Especially Can we have both? Inflation keeps going up and all these kinds of things, right? Our one dollar has become less and less valuable. What was that somebody said? Can we have both? You cannot have both. You got to choose one. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so present value means money's worth more today than tomorrow, like I just said. Or if I give you money today, I expect more in the future. So if I give you a dollar, I want more than a dollar back tomorrow. Or if I give the company money, like buying stock today, I expect more back in the future. Um, so in practice, it's basically why we get money, uh, why we're paying interest in a savings account. Uh, it's also why mortgages cost money above the house price and uh, why we expect stock prices to go up more than either of those. So we'll kind of go over all that. So how much more is $1 a day? We're gonna do math now, sorry about that. Uh, so the present value equals the future value divided by one plus the interest rate. So that's the okay. basic formula for how it works. So if someone offers me 60 bucks over two years and I have to give them $100 right now and I want a 10% return, should I do it? Feel free to shout out anybody. <laughs> 60 over two. So I get 120 total, but it takes two years. But I got to give them $100 right now. Mm, no idea. No idea. All right. Well, that's good because we have math. We're going to do it right now. Yeah. So, oh, this excellent. This is all you do. $60 divided by 1 plus 0 0.1 because I want 10%, right? I know I can go get 9% down the street or whatever. Um, so I do 60 divided by, well, you can see the formula there. And it comes out to a present value of 1.21 or $121. Or sorry, when you add it up, it's $104. $104. So I would take essentially $100 now is less than $60 over two years. So yes, I want to take the deal, right? So if they ask me for $105 and they give me $120 back, I wouldn't take it. Unless it's really asking for $100 and I'm looking for a 10% return, I'm taking that deal. And that's effectively what we're doing with stocks. Hmm. This is very simple in comparison. <laughs> Does that make sense? Does anybody not understand how this just worked? Hmm. It's great. 
All right. So yeah, 120 bucks in two years is worth $104 right now with a 10% return. Mm. Deal. Okay. Yay. All right. That's my cat. <laughs> All right. I took the deal, so I'm richer now as a result. Uh, so here's effectively that same formula, but with future cash flow right up here, replacing that $60, and then whack, which I'll go over that, weighted average cost of capital, replacing that 10% that we had uh, from below, from before. So we have to find two variables, essentially the free cash flow, which is the net operating profit, so that's like your earnings per share, but you take out the capital expenditures and the taxes. So those are the only things, two things you'll take out. And then you also have to find the interest rate, which we call the weighted average cost of capital. Mm. And this is determined by figuring the average bond rate that a company can get plus the average equity rate. And there's very complicated formulas, so I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail on this, uh, but that's basically how you find the interest rate. In the bond rate, you would just look up recent bond offerings that that company has had. Um, you can find this online pretty easily. So free cash flow, it's basically the money that's available to investors and not required to run the core business. So if you had a small business and say you had some normal expenses um, that you had to run the business and then you're left with, you know, a thousand dollars of profit at the end of the year um and you say you know say it's a, a lawn mowing business right you have a thousand dollars in profit left over after you've run everything you paid all your employees the gas to run the lawn mowers and the truck to get it there and all that kind of stuff you have a thousand dollars and you want to say buy a new lawn mower for next year which costs you two hundred dollars so you take out that 200 that's your capital expenditure and you have eight hundred dollars left over so as the owner what can you do with that 800 bucks you can keep it for yourself. You could pay it out for other investors. You could go buy another company. You could do all kinds of things, right? Uh, which is essentially what large corporations like we're investing in are trying to determine with their free cash flow. So as an investor, that free cash flow is what's coming back to you theoretically, that 800 bucks. So if someone came to you and said, hey, you wanna invest in my lawn mowing business, um, I want a million dollars and I'll pay you $800 a year, you would probably say, I don't think that's a very good deal. Uh, but if they asked you for 10,000 and they pay you 800 every year, you might take that deal. Um, so that's effectively what we're doing. Uh, so that's the money available to investors. Oops, free cash flow. Again, which is operating profit minus taxes and capital expenditures. So taxes, I meant, didn't mention that. We're assuming it's zero at this point. Uh, but capital expenditures are like buying our new lawnmower. Uh, so you can find the net operating profit and the taxes come from the income statement. Mm -hmm. And the operating profit is calculated as this. It's the revenue minus the cost of goods, minus operating expenses, the GNA, and then taking out a change in working capital in taxes. So the change in working capital is very minor usually. Um, that's really the money it takes to run the business. So as the cost of things gets more expensive, you might have to put a little bit more in like your cash account, right? To make sure you're paying all your bills on time and stuff like that. Um, capital expenditures. So that comes from your statement of cash flows. It's under financing activities. And it's usually called investments in property, plant and equipment. Um, so then you'll take these numbers and you're going to estimate the percent increases for three to five years. I got a little spreadsheet I'll show you in a second. Um, and then you're just effectively going to use the inflation rate for every year beyond year three or year five, um, just to calculate a, a terminal value. Because in off years, if you're projecting a 20% increase in 10 years from now, it's like, just wait five years and then, and then invest. <laughs> Uh, so weighted average cost of capital is the debt value divided by the debt value plus market cap times the rate of debt. So trying to figure out how much 
debt financing they have. So how much money do we go get from banks versus how much money do we get from, uh, you know, the stock market? Um, so then we take that times rate of debt. This is very complicated, so you can look at this later. And then you take the market cap divided by the debt value plus the market cap times the rate of equity. And that's how you figure the cost of capital. So the debt value, you're just gonna get from the balance sheet. I use Disney in this example, 23.6 billion. Um, rate of debt, I just found, remember they had a recent bond was about two and a half percent. I Googled it, as you can see. The market cap is just the shares outstanding times the share price. Um, so you can usually find this on Yahoo or Morningstar, wherever they usually post this for you. So the market cap of Disney was $260 billion. Um, so the rate of equity uses this thing called the capital asset pricing model. And it's this formula. You take the risk-free rate, which is effectively like 1% right now, maybe 1.5%. The beta of the stock, which you also will find from Yahoo or Google or Morningstar or something like that. And then times a market risk premium. So I use a 10-year bond percent. That's what most people use for the risk-free rate because you can always go buy a 10 year bond and you know you can always get whatever that interest rate is for money. Um, beta is just a measure of volatility. So how much does it go up or go down in relation to an index, to the index? And then the market risk premium is effectively your desired rate of return. So in that first example, would be your 10% uh, or my 10% minus the risk-free rate. So whatever the 10 year bond percent is. So that's basically how much extra you're trying to get from investing in this stock versus just investing in the risk-free rate. Um, so in this example, when I did this back in January, it was about 1.8% for a 10 year. Disney's volatility for beta was 1.05. And then I took 10 minus 1.8%. And that gives me a 10.4% weighted cost of capital. So I take my 23, put my two and a half there. My 260 billion goes there, 10.4, and I get a 9.8% because I'm most equity financed, and that rate is a lot higher. I end up with a higher rate, which we'll see how that comes into play later. Well, I didn't want to do it because this is a two hour meeting, and I, was going to, I wasn't going to be able to look at it or anything, so I took it out. But if you're going to be there and you want to do it, go ahead. I will. Uh, um, so we estimate growth and end of the values for three years. So these are the values in here with my 9.8%. I have 11.3 free cash flow, then 13.8 and 16.5. And then I do 16.5 times 1.018 because I've just estimated it at inflation. And then last, I subtract the outstanding debt, divide by the shares outstanding and compare it to the current share price. So key takeaways before I show you my example, I have six minutes. Uh, is future cash flows increase, present values increase. As rates, interest rates drop, present values also increase. So ways to increase or decrease free cash flows, revenues, sell more stuff. That's one way to do it. Uh, decrease your costs. That increases. So a decrease or increase in your expenses will uh, decrease or increase your cash flows. Um, increase or decrease your capital expenditures. So a good example is Tesla. They're building a factory, you know, they're spending billions of dollars building factories all over the world so they can make more revenue. That CapEx unfortunately decreases their free cash flow, making it a less attractive investment. So it's really a balance between spending enough to keep growing your revenue and uh, not spending too much to where your CapEx is outpacing your revenue, which is essentially what Tesla's been doing. And a big part of the argument uh, between investors on how much it's really worth. Uh, and then taxes. So you could offshore uh, or put overseas your taxes, or you can vote for Bernie Sanders to increase the taxes. Um, and that's one way to increase or decrease your cash flows. Uh, so way to increase or decrease rates. So the Fed could cut the interest rates. That's one that's happened recently, uh, which has lowered all the rates um, for everything. Um, you could get increase or decrease your lending rate. So if you had a higher credit rating, your interest rate might go down. If you have a lower credit rating, your interest rate might go up. 
Um, volatility of the stock price will increase or decrease it. So if your stock is more volatile, that'll increase the price that investors want. If it's less volatile, it'll decrease the price. Um, and then the desired rate of return. So I simply chose 10%. Um, if I chose a lower percentage, eight or 9%, the value that I'm willing to pay for a share of stock goes up based on that formula we saw earlier, um, which we'll go over a little math on how that works. So, with that, let me show you a different screen. See if I can change it here. So right here, I've got my Disney example. And you can see I've got revenue, cost of goods sold, sg and taxes, CapEx, and a change in working capital. So this was the revenue, I think, in the last fiscal year. And then I estimated these based on these growth estimates down here. So you can see, Oops. So all this value does is take 69.6 .6 and then give us a 16, 6.2% increase. And that figures out all these values. Then we're calculating our free cash flows here by just subtracting all these expenses from our revenue. And then right here we have our terminal value, which is essentially taking this last free cash flow and then multiplying it by this 1% risk free rate we have down here. Um, and assuming a 1% growth rate kind of to infinity. So we have our debt, 23.6, our equity, which was 260 billion at the time, cost of debt, two and a half, risk-free rate, 1%, beta 1.05, et cetera. Terminal free cash flow, I would actually did 2%, not one. Uh, share with outstanding, we have 1.78 billion, and then all that adds up to a per share discounted value, $127.18, and the current price at the time was $144.33. So we would not buy Disney at this rate unless it was, uh, the current price was below this 127.18. So very similar to how the SSG works. But one thing I did wanna show, so far expected rate of return, we just chose 10% kind of blindly, um, but maybe that's not realistic, right? So bonds are paying, one and a half or two percent um dividend yields are only around three or four so maybe we're willing to accept eight percent right we just type in eight and based on that the value of disney that we're willing to pay goes up to 167 dollars and 36 cents based on these cash flow values up here um, so in this case if we only wanted an eight percent return we would buy disney stock uh, again very similar to the ssg so one last thing to point out, and then I'll be done, answer questions, is this right here is simply adding up the value of all these cash flows. So what we have up here, the present value of future cash flows and the total debt. And then it's dividing that by the number of shares right here. And that's how it's calculating our value. So we're using total dollar numbers and not per share or anything like that. And that's how we calculate a discounted cash flow. So it takes into account near-term cash flows are much more heavily weighted because of the uh, interest rate calculation. Any questions? I'm done. Okay, well, thank you, Matt. I mean, I, unless there are any questions, I think I see some mics Matt. unmuting. Well, we have a question, want. Matt. So we want a 15% return, right? Is this the, uh, there are shares. Yes, typically you would look for 15%, right? So you type 15 in here. And yeah. now it's well, to get that based on these growth estimates, which again, is only 6.2, right? So you could look at the SSG and say, geez, is this a accurate growth estimate? I just plug numbers in. Um, that would say you would only pay $79 for Disney. But, but Disney is a large company, right? I don't think a 10% is uh, is feasible for Disney. Right. I, I don't think a 15% applies to all companies, Megumi. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. I know. Yeah. Well, but right. this, part, this is a great, can we use this just to validate our, uh, SSG. our what's it, SSGs? Yeah, definitely. Um, you can use it. A lot of these rates, you know, 
they change pretty wildly based on the rate that you choose, right? So you can see the difference between 15 and 10 is about $60 or 50 or $60 worth of share price difference. Uh, yeah, so what are really the other not that expected return and you go, well, Disney's a large company. So what do I really want? Like, what am I okay with? Um, and kind of balance. That. Is that the only judgment that we need to put in? I, I wasn't following oh, exactly. No. Anything All in the yellow, yellow ones? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Are those easy find? You just said it just went to your favorite um, finance site. Yeah. Okay. It takes a while, honestly. Like it does take a while to find all of this. Um, it gives you a little bit more granular look into the company. So now you're starting to evaluate. Well, how much is their capex growing? Like, am I having to spend a lot to keep this business running, or is my capital expenditure is pretty low? Uh, what's my cost of goods look like? Is it growing fast? Is it growing slow? Um, so you're kind of breaking it down into more parts. Matt, I have a question. <laughs> yeah. There are there are 18 different interest rates here. So this is highly subject to the input to uh, these 18 numbers. Uh, yeah, definitely. So the interest rates that you're putting in are the risk-free rate, right? Which that's going to be the 10 year bond. So it just is what it is. Um, really estimated that. The cost of debt is just what the company has recently financed debt at. So it's not like you're just choosing any number that you want. Really, the only number you're choosing is this expected return right here. So, like, what do you personally want as an investor for expected return? I guess this is different than what we do for SSG. The return is calculated based on our projections. So this, your return here is based on assumption. Yeah, like, based on what you want. Wait, well, I, okay, what we want. Your risk you're taking on, right? Oh, so your okay. Risk in return is really mm. all you're doing. If this is a very that. speculative company, you probably put 15 or maybe 20 percent. Because the hard work is really to do those growth estimates, right? Like what you just said. The, as, as these GDP. ones here yeah yeah and that's it's always the hardest it, part right it tastes like the preferred procedure but yet it, it it kind of requires you to do more digging right and it's not dependent so much on growth either um since it's just looking at the free cash flows Interesting. so have you, have, the, you, have you used this um method and compared to our ssg to see how close? Um, yeah, for some companies. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say for large companies, the SSG and discounted cash flow are usually pretty similar just because there's so many people following larger companies that they mm -hmm. use. Mm -hmm. um, where this can come in handy is small companies, uh, like really small companies, private companies, um, things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So it recently for a small industrial company that didn't seem to really fit the SSG so well, like they didn't have as long of a history. Um, so it was good for that purpose and to kind of estimate, okay, you know, after COVID, what do we think revenues will look like and costs and, and things like that. But then it's harder to find information on smaller companies, yeah? Um, well, this all just comes from public information. So this okay. is, you can pretty much get from their annual report most of the time. Yeah, all this should come from the annual report, except for the beta that you can usually find online because they calculate automatically. Cool. Sure. Um, anyway, this is just, I want to go over like another method for valuing companies. And sometimes this works well, like when the multiples, you know, sometimes we see it's a high of 400 and a low of 10 or something like that, and it just doesn't make a lot of sense. This kind of cuts that that mm. bit out. You know what I mean? Thank you, Matt. Yeah, we, thank we, you. Very much. Yeah, we need to keep moving along, but that was a great presentation. Thanks. Um, yeah, I definitely run into that issue where the low price and the high price just seem like a range that. Um, that seem incongruent when doing the SSG, so this will be really helpful. Um, 
So, Jay, I've just passed you the screen. I believe now we'll move on to our stock study for the evening. I believe um, G, Chris, and Ela are covering the consumer electronics sector and have a, a company to present for us today. Yes. So I will start with uh, Isla, Chris, and I are in the stock study committee for the June stock study mm -hmm. committee. We will talk about how do we pick this industry and the, uh, the company and what is this consumer electronic industry. And tonight we will present only one stock, uh, iRobot Corporation, and Isla will explain why there's only one company. Uh, where is the competitor? So she will cover that topic. Um, so how do we pick this industry? Uh, Tom Loftus sent to me, can you guys hear me okay? I heard of some background. Tom, Loft, Tom Loftus sent me um, Ken Kavula and the Mark Robinson webinar about managing a portfolio uh, on May 13, uh, last month. Uh, he wants me to, for this month's stock study, he wants me, to, he wants us to use the method just to see how does that work. And basically, it, um, can Kavola talk about selling strategies, how to categorize our portfolio by core and non-core stocks? Uh, so sell the core company if less than money market rates. Uh, sell non-core if return is less than average return forecast. Well, if any companies that return, relatively return, drops below 20%. And the last one is to use the Roman candle, which is a ISI, is a technical uh, analysis. So this group, we don't have, Isla, Chris and I, we don't have enough knowledge in technical analysis, so we did not evaluate this one. Uh, oops, sorry. So Ken Kovula's definition about core and non-core. For the core, uh, he defined as a high quality, excellent company, have a long-term track of records, uh, so, and a high earning per share stability, and the sales growth greater than 2%. In his presentation, he did not say, I, we did not understand why it's only 2% for sales growth. But in his presentation, he did mention is for the core, basically is you hold the company eight to 15 years, as long as it makes sense. And also the potential return is not below money market rate, like that we call cash deposit uh, or CD or saving account. Like give us how much, when the, less than a percent, about around 1%, I don't know how much it will be, but very low. And also up straight parallel. And we know that means that the, our SSG, we're looking at sales, earnings, pre-tax profit. We want the graph looks up straight parallel. That defines the core. For non-core, basically is cyclical, turnaround company, speculative, um, early life cycle. They don't have a like a long time record. For example, the company maybe I own just IPO'd last three years. Doesn't have a minimum of five years. We have very limited earning per share history. Um, so that's how he defined as non-core. So we went to our club portfolio and we, based on Ken Kavula's definition, and we categorized the last, uh, the bottom four companies are non-core, uh, Biomarine, eBay, IIPR, and Vertex. The remaining of those, we consider those as core company based on Ken Kavula's definition. And so, okay, the bottom line based on that is, None of those is below money, all the CD, sorry, all the core companies, none is below the money market rate. And I, we suggest that we may consider buy more, was to sell Qualys or um, Domino Pizza, which I will show you next slide, uh, you will see, because they are right now holding the less than 3%, as better investing was saying that if it's less than 3%, if you don't have enough, it's not worth it, it's not worth your time to research, to, to follow it. Or you can just add on more. So that's why we suggest, you know, either buy or sell. For the non-core, actually they're doing quite well, uh, except the Vertex lost uh, 12, 16, 12, almost 13%. The reason uh, is because there is a discontinued drug for a rare genetic blood disorder that causes lung and the liver disease. 
So uh, you, um, Reddy has sent us a few articles about, you know, Vertex. He still thinks that Vertex is a great company. Uh, plus, we have not hold this company very long, only like, what, a few months? So, um, and none of these in our portfolio, none of them are, uh, is relatively return drops below 20%. Okay. Using that method, nothing stands out. We, there's nothing stands out. So what do we do next? So then we review the club portfolio and we look in our club portfolio. We noticed that, that, um, the technology sector, the money-making sector, we only have a 7%. And we, we were thinking, oh, let's maybe look into this one. And so in that, by industry, in that technology sector, we have software infrastructure, only 2.6%, less than three. We also have a restaurant is less than three, Domino Pizza, I early on we'll talk about. And be specific in that industry is a Qualys 2.6 and Domino Pizza, we have 2.5. Um, so these are the two companies that we may consider to uh, buy more or sell. And um, Chris is going to give the Q1 report on Qualys. And uh, Domino Pizza, I think I just gave a report. Domino Pizza is doing great. I don't know if we want to sell it or if we want to buy more. That depends on me. And I think he's the follower. Um, then we looked at club uh, company size for the portfolio. As betting investing recommend, small size company, 25%, medium 50, and large 25. So our portfolio is small, about 14%, medium, we have about 35, and we have like about 48% of a large, including mega. So the conclusion for us, okay, let's focus on small, medium sized companies in technology. We also looked at watch list the, from our club, uh, Tom Loftus also suggested that we, nothing stand out, nothing is really uh, stand out us in that buy zone, a small, small, medium sized company. So then what we did is, okay, we went to SSG uh, screening, sc uh, to using a screening tool, we set up small, medium sized company, sales earnings, let's say greater than 12% in technology sector, that we found out a bunch of it. And then we pre-screened uh, all of them and we found IRBT, iRobot. So, uh, and then the next step for us is to find a competitor. And we couldn't find any strong competitor in the same industry. And because iRobot using robotics, and then we thought, oh, how about let's just research a robotics company? No, any strong finding, nothing, fundamentally nothing strong. Uh, we researched several places of talking about robotics. IRBT was almost at the, every single top 10 robotics company, IRBT name was in it. And IRBT, the SSG, looks better than any of those. Um, so we do find one company, Ali Motion, looks okay. It looks, this graph, graphically looks okay, but uh, it, it is in electronic components. So Isla is going to cover more later on about, you know, the competitors, because you know, they are LG, Panasonic, Dyson, you know, she will talk about all of those. So next, Chris is going to go over the industry, consumer electronics industry. Chris, you want me to look at my screen or you want to look at your screen? Um, I can, I can do it. Okay. Yeah, I think that's better. So you can flip the slide any, let's see, where is Chris? Oh, there is. Okay. There you go. Okay. Um. Do you guys see the screen? Yeah. Uh. Yes. Yes. Okay. So consumer electronics industry. So what is the consumer electronics industry? So these are the companies in consumer electronics are companies that operate by manufacturing, designing, producing, supplying, and distributing electronics goods, accessories, equipment, and appliances. So this doesn't just mean like vacuum cleaners or like air conditioning. This also like extends towards like mobile phones, um, calculators, and cameras. So like there's a bunch of devices. So obviously because it's like such, um, I guess like such a big industry or like it has like such a wide variety, there the major players can like are Samsung, Sony, Apple, Microsoft, Lenovo, Dell, to like computers or like phones or even like household appliances. Like these are all major players in this industry. 
So um, in particular, we're looking to iRobot, which is a household durable. What does this mean? It's like it's like a household appliance um, type of company, right? So here we can see a graph of the household durables industry in comparison to the S&P 500 in the past year. And we can see here that in the past year, the household durables industry performed better than the S&P 500 index. So next, um, here, this, this was taken from a report on the vacuum fan and small household appliances manufacturing in the US. And this was an industry report. So here we can see that um, the revenue in this um, industry is 4 billion. However, the growth has not been that spectacular in the last five years. And it's only predicted to be 2.5% growth in the next five years as well. And the profit, we can see that the last five years of profit is 2.4% and it's um, 350.3 million this past year. And yeah, and the profit margin is 8.8% and the profit percentage is 0.9%. Yeah. So the industry outlook. So here we can see that the industry revenue is expected to rise at an annualized rate of 2.5% to $4.5 billion over the five years to 2026. Mm -hmm. And competition, so the main part of like household durables industry is that competition is mainly with foreign manufacturers, which kind of like drives like local, like um, I guess like American companies to create like premium products, such as like an iRobox case, um, robotic vacuum cleaners, right? Instead of like the manual ones. So how, so the reason why um, industry outlook is expected to rise is because as consumers earn more money, as like COVID is like, I guess like as people are recovering from COVID, they will be more likely to purchase industry products. So yeah, so the last slide here that's talking about, um, I guess robotics somewhat. So. What is robotics? Robotics is an interdisciplinary sector of science and engineering dedicated to design, construction, and use of mechanical robots. And this can be like over a variety of things. And specifically, it's it's always been kind of like more like um, car or automotive robot robot uh, robo, robot orders over like in the past. But however. Um, in the past year, year, the orders of robot from non-automotive sectors has surpassed um, the orders in the automotive um, sector. So in particular, we can look at North America. So in 2020, um, we or, like North American companies ordered um, 31,000 robotic units, which is valued at $1.5 billion. And in quarter four alone, um, they ordered 9,972 units valued at $479 million. And this is a 3.5 increase in sales from 2019 quarter four. So yeah, so we can see that um, robotics is definitely growing. However, again, with what we said earlier is that it's, it's more like across a variety of sectors. So it's not really like just in, I guess like just in like vacuum cleaners, right? It's like a lot of different things. People are using more AI, more robots and auto stuff. But yeah, so we'll now pass it down to Isla. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, oh, sorry, I have to move this thing out of the way. Okay, present. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so I'm going to talk about the iRobot company. Uh, uh oh, it's not moving. It's not moving. You see a mouse? Let me do page down. I'm doing page down. Okay. And that's not working either. Using your mouse. Ah, there you okay. go. <laughs> Thank you. Trying to use the keyboard. Okay. 
So iRobot is a mid-sized sales company. They had uh, 1.4 billion in revenue in 2020. 2020 saw a 17.8% revenue increase over 2019. So their sales include vacuums and mops. They make coding robots for educational purposes and they also make handheld vacuums. The vacuum cleaner market itself is valued at about $10.1 billion by industry data. And the robotic vacuum market is valued at $2.56 billion. iRobot is the leading robotic vacuum brand in the world. In the past, iRobot has sold uh, robotic pool cleaners and gutter cleaners and lawnmowers, but currently they're concentrating on the in-house market rather than worrying about the outside market. Their additional services, iRobot has launched a subscription service and it's designed to solidify their relationships with their customers and to increase the convenience of its products. iRobot does not currently report revenue from the subscription service. The subscription includes dedicated customer service representatives who each customer is supposed to be able to have contact with this representative each and every time they have to talk with anyone. Automatic delivery of consumable parts like brushes and bags. They have uh, software enhancements and preferred maintenance and the ability to upgrade their model, their current floor models every three years. Uh, at the moment, their subscription service is about $29 a month. So iRobot is considered an expanding global franchise. As you can see, it's been growing at a double digit rate for the past five years. And in terms of their regions, the Americas are their most profitable region, which accounts for 57% of their revenue. So how are they gonna support their expansion? So it says, so if we look here, we see that although the non-robotic cleaners are still dominant, their market share has fallen to 75% from 87% in 2012. So robot, robotic vacuums are gaining share. iRobot estimates that there are about 19 million households that have vacuum cleaners in the US and iRobot is now in about 15% of those homes. The in, internet of things and smart home trends like automatic charging and voice activated commanding robotic vacuum cleaners more attractive to customers. And iRobot sees a much bigger potential market in the long term. This slide is a breakdown of iRobot's share of the market in the most important regions of the world. The smallest share is a 50% share, and that's in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. The other shares, as you can see, are much larger. But even in Japan, where heavyweights Panasonic and Hitachi also make robotic vacuums, they are distant runners up to iRobot, even in Japan. And this market has expanded by double digits in the year 2020 during the pandemic. So now many companies make robots and they make robots of lots of different types. Large companies like Epson, Stryker, IBM, Sony, and Honda that make robots, but they don't report the revenue separately. So we don't really know how much they make from that. And most companies that only make robots, that's their primary product, most of them are private. And although iRobot has not said that they plan to enter any other robot segments like the commercial sector, they will need to do that in the future to maintain their position. So they have a several different pillars that they're going to use to promote their strategy. One of them is to continue the growth of their connected customer base. In the first quarter of 21, they had 10.7 million customers were engaged with the robot experience. This means an active social media presence, dedicated customer service communications, firmware upgrades, and all of that helps to keep their customers in their family, not wandering off to other brands. Part of the strategy also includes maintaining its hardware and software upgrade cycles. New models, new floor models are usually available approximately every three years. Software upgrades occur about every three months. So that's a lot of work that they have to do. So iRobot intends to also, part of their strategy is to maintain their retail outlets such as Best Buy, Walmart, and Target. They want to encourage customers to opt into their communication so that they can, can keep them in the family. And they have to work very hard to keep their customer data secure, including mapping of customers' homes, which is a part of the latest models that they have available. 
Now, these trends will improve iRobot's stickiness with their customers as a brand and as a service. In 2020, iRobot also expanded its direct-to-customer sales through its website and the iRobot app. E-commerce sales are rising, and Amazon remains a very, very strong channel for the company, as well as the other retail outlets. They have partnerships with Google, with Amazon, and other smart home systems, and that helps secure how essential the essential nature of the cleaning experience. Our iRobot makes some of cleaning chores less drudgery and more convenient. So their sales strategies also include expansion of revenue and serve and Earnings will be supported through the recurring subscription revenue, bundling of models and services. So now you can buy the floor vacuum and the mop together instead of separately. They have to maintain their product cycles at reasonable prices. They have to maintain consistent software upgrades, as I said, currently every three months. And they have to design models who use raw materials that avoid supply chain delays, as a lot of companies are experiencing now. And they're trying to decrease costs. One way is by moving their facilities that build their robots to Malaysia away from China. So they will be decreasing tariffs. So now I'm going to try to go to the SSG. Uh, here we go. OK, so this is live. All right. So, so sales, pre-tax profit and earnings are up and to the right, as you can see, it's mostly straight. Sales growth for the last 10 years has been 14.8%, but more importantly, for the past five years, it's been 20.5%. The average sales estimate, if we're using value line, is about 14%. Now, starting with the annual data, preferred procedure earnings forecast came out to be 7.9%. Pre-tax mar profit margin hit a high of 13.1% in 2020. Return on equity in 2020 exceeds their five-year average. Their debt is about 3.1%, which is most like, I think it's most likely leases because the company does not admit to having any traditional debt at all. Sorry. Okay, over. All right. So, uh, the high PE of 29.3 yields a high price of $220.30. The low price that I used was $67.55, which was the 52-week low price for the stock. And although the average PE is almost the, double the current PE, it does show that there is room for PE expansion. So, as you can see, it comes out in the buy zone with a 4.6 to 1 upside downside ratio and a 131 percent potential price appreciation. In section five, I'll get to that. Okay, there we go. Uh, in section five, the compound annual return is estimated to be between 12 percent for the average and 18.3 percent for the high PE. And that sounds, that is pretty good and meets our goal. Robotic vacuum industry data predicts that a compound annual rate growth, they think they will have a 17.7% annual growth rate through the year 2027. So with all of that in mind, my recommendation is a buy. Uh, that guidance is from company guidance or robotics guidance? No, that was robotics industry guidance. Oh, okay, robotics industry guidance. Right. So now, the global pandemic makes us pay more attention to how clean our homes and workspaces and gathering places are. We have to spend a lot more money and time doing that. iRobot is definitely a benefit from this trend in the home and possibly in the commercial sector. It is an attractive company. It's in an expanding industry, and it is at the moment the cutting edge of technology. So again, I recommend a buy. Okay, questions? I have a quick question. It's because it's um, some of their parts are subscription based. Did they talk about um, any sort of uh, recyclability of their products at life's no. end? No, 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 they don't. It's too bad. Okay. I have what a question mean? about like a recycle material. Re yeah, so that they can be used. You know, yeah. yeah, there are a lot of companies that make various kinds of uh, products um, that are new and wonderful, but when it comes to recycling them, they haven't figured that. So iRobot so hasn't figured that yeah. out. Yeah, 
just all the stuff going into landfills from the oh, electronics. I'm curious. I'm going to do a research on that company, see if they talk about that recycling. Yeah, they haven't so far. They don't, they haven't in their uh, 10 Qs or their 10 Ks, they haven't mentioned recycling. Okay. That doesn't mean they aren't working on it or aren't thinking about it or aren't planning for it, but they just don't mention it. They haven't mentioned it publicly. I have a thinking about to looking for a company in that industry, recycling industry. That would be good. Mm. I think that's getting harder and harder. What? Yeah, I think that's getting harder and harder. A lot of the companies that used to take recycling stuff, have, one of the, so China was one of the countries that used to take everybody's recycling. Yes. But apparently in the last few that. years, they have kind of cut down on how much recycling they're taking. And so mm -hmm. what happens to a lot of countries' garbage like ours is it just goes to other countries and it gets buried or it sits in a landfill. So none of us are really good at figuring out what to do with the stuff we don't use anymore. Yeah, I'm thinking yeah. about, I have seen the companies that use uh, glass, you know, uh, mm -hmm. use uh -huh. recycled glass to make something else. So I, I, th I think, I think that would be a good idea. But I think there's, treated. yeah, I'm just not sure. I think there's so few actual elements that can be recycled into something that anybody's willing to actually make or buy. Mm. So most of the, most of the things that go into making the products that we use are not things that anybody has even considered how to use it again. Yeah. I have a question about the high PE that you define on your SSG. Uh -huh. it seems like it's kind of close to the average PE. Uh, maybe I'm trying to understand that more. Um, the high PE of 29. Yeah, uh -huh. I see the average. I use the average. Result. Yeah, I use the average. Oh. Okay. And Ayala, Ayala, yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. You can see the uh, the PE contraction in both uh, high PE and low PE in 2020, and you treat it as the outliers. Can you explain why? Um, primarily, well, 2020, because they, those were so much lower than what they had been over the last five, over the last five or even 10 years. Right, but then there must be a reason. Did you find out the reasons why? Yeah, they sold, they, well, they, they say they sold more, but the prices that they were able to get were less. Was that because tariff? Some because of tariffs, some because of uh, supply chain issues where they weren't able to make as many as they wanted to. And some were just because, you know, in this country particularly, people were buying things, but they, uh, there were a lot of people who weren't, who might otherwise be able to buy a, a robot would not be able to do it during 2020. Because of COVID? Well, not so much. Well, maybe because of COVID, but because their finances were more constrained in 2020 than they would be than they were in 2019 or would be in 2022. Can so we, buying yeah. a, buying an iRobot does require that you have some level of disposable income. If you're used to mopping and sweeping your own floors um, and your money is tight, then you're not going to really consider buying an iRobot. If you have disposable income and you have the time, then yeah, you can do that. But there were lots of people who might otherwise have considered it who may have put that purchase off for maybe 2022 or 23. Okay, thank you. Do we have any motions? We need to um, well, move on. I, well, I think, we should, I think we should do the look at the quarterly and annual reports before we turn to the motions because I think Bernard has recommended a buy for FAF. So I, I think, think it might uh, be a good Mina, idea. To we look changed, for sorry, Mina. We changed oh, the sorry. procedure a little bit. We took right. uh, our mentor, Mary, uh, say, since we are talking about stock studies and we know the numbers, he suggests that we do the motion okay. as we are going through the stock. Sounds good to me. We were just trying to see if that's going to work. Try to do something different. So does anyone have a motion? But we're not voting now, right? No, we're just a. Uh, okay. Because we don't know what else is going to be a buy. Um, what are the motions there are going to? There's going to be for the rest of the meeting. 
Oh yeah, you're right, Joanne. Right now we only have a twenty. Uh, we only have a two thousand dollars. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't have a twenty thousand anymore. We don't. Oh, oh so now we have to, now we have to be careful again, huh? That's exactly right. We really cannot. Yeah, <laughs> maybe this is not going to work. We do have yeah, to. Yeah, I think it's better when we were cash. When we yeah. were cash. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Okay. You see, you see, constrained in. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Down decisions at this point. Yeah. yeah so, now uh, we have to be more careful, right? We definitely. <laughs> we so might be think, one of the people not buying an iRobot. Right? <laughs> that's for sure. Um, I'm. Uh, I think Bernard recommended a buy because I think we should only look again at the buys and sells. I think everything this month that has been reported is a hold, except for FAF, where Bernard recommends a buy. So if it works, Bernard, I will. Pass you the screen or Bernard's not here. Oh, he Bernard is not here. He's, yeah, he's out with his wife. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're right. You mentioned that at the beginning of the meeting. Yes. Um, and it looks like Haney is the follower or is the is the uh, reviewer, reviewer. for uh, FAF. So maybe um, it looks like Haney's not here as well either. So mm. not sure if anybody's had any had an opportunity yeah. to review I, the FAF right. report. Right. I'm actually curious about Qualys. Um, Chris, may talk about Qualys. Qualys, the reason why the Qualys price got dropped initially was, sorry, Chris, is that okay? I talk about Qualys about yeah, the, go for it. the go okay. For it. So the Qualys price got dropped. It was because the CEO, uh, the last, the previous quarter, CEO suddenly just left the company um, because health issue and the price got dropped. Nothing wrong with the products. And this May, was this month, Chris, or last month, he passed away. So they have a new oh. CEO. Um, I'm he passed away? Yeah, he passed away. Oh, oh boy. And um, so I am looking, I'm, I'm a peer reviewer of Aqualis. And okay. I felt like, what was my recommendation? I felt like we should buy more Aqualis if dropped to like a $96 a share or how much? 99, 96, I don't know. How much? Yeah, you said 96, but it's back up again. It's 103. And, yeah. Okay, so that, so what's so that was a quick buy drop. based on the SSG. Based on the SSG, it's a hold. Even if we estimate it at eleven percent, it's still a hold. Okay, hold. The buy is at the cutoff at the hundred dollar. So we just ninety six. So what was that? What's today's? Hmm. So like that was just about... my my recommendation. Well, I think hmm. Qualys Qualys could be better evaluated, like because the CEO was paid. The earnings dropped to one penny, but really the adjusted earnings were 74 cents. So it's a lot, lot better stock than than the SSG evaluation we put in. Mm -hmm. I agree. Another thing is when uh, Ila talk about Robot to talk about security as well, because you 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 know you can map out a house. I'm curious that if if uh, Qualys is not Qualys, iRobot is a, is a client of a Qualys using their products. Mm. Well, you know, there's so many cybersecurity companies out there and each of right. them, some of them do different things. So yeah. one company could be a client of several different cybersecurity firms. Mm. So, and that might be a little hard to find that information out there, you know, might not get yeah. that information yeah. up easily. They do, actually Qualys has a slide to show all the clients. I don't remember. I can, I can pull something very quick. You guys can't carry on. I'm just. So what about Vertex? It's dropped thirty dollars. Oh yeah. What about Vertex? That was because of that that medication. Yeah. Did they have to withdraw the medication from the market, or they just put a black box warning on it? Well, let's ask James. He follows it, so. Oh yeah. Um. Actually, my last quarter's review, uh, was a whole. Uh, even though the SSG shows a buy, because we have a big position on that company, so I didn't mm -hmm. recommend to buy more. Now the price further drop, and I didn't look into it because I, I wasn't prepared to present it. And so, so but it's so dropped $30. Look at, Ready's yep. look into it. Ready, Ready, do you have any insight into the Vertex? Uh, well, where am I? Am I? Uh, no. Um, where, okay. We have two uh, biotech companies, Vertex and Biomarin. Um, 
the, the all biotech companies are very very volatile uh, mm. very very extremely volatile we should not judge biotechs compared to other uh, stocks and uh, but the press point on vertex is that it is it is it has a completely world monopoly on cystic fibrosis drugs they are trying to mm. diversify into other new research areas and they are acquiring companies and um, the, uh, every uh, probably 10 drugs that a biotech company tries they are successful one and that's where they make the money so uh, mm. there will be a lot of negative news uh, not only that competition positive news also it affects so we should hold we, we bought it only four months ago um it's uh, the about five percent or six percent drop is uh, not that much we should hold and study unless there is a really really bad uh, very big uh, negative news then we should dump it what, what do you yeah. think about buying more pardon what do you think about buying more? Um, what's the percentage we have? I closed my slides. I think we already purchased twice, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 6.3. 6 yeah, that's why yeah. I didn't recommend to buy more last yeah, quarter. Even though... if, you buy, if you buy more, it will only increase the share. Yeah, um, yeah I, would, I would stay put at this time. Yeah. I would we, we, can buy, this we can buy more because price reduced uh, but the the biotech is totally different ball game mm. hey jay i have this slide for the customers oh great yeah i was just looking okay let's uh, put on your let's see yeah who do they have microsoft oracle yeah, these are their customers, but it's not really going to be the people that they do vendor business with. Right. I was just thinking, I just want to see if on this customer, the iRobot will be on it. No, they are not. Maybe they're not big enough. These companies look like our big companies. Yeah, right? they got 19,000 customers. So it may Right. I know. I just want to see on this picture if they yeah. have any. Not nearly as big as Alphabet or you know, yeah. ADP or Amazon or whatever. So maybe yeah. not, didn't make this group, but yeah. maybe, because like I said, most most of the um, cybersecurity companies do, some of them do several different things and they're, and most companies when they engage in trying to make sure that their uh, customers' data is secure have to, have to engage with several different companies to keep that whole chain secure. Oh. Did we, did Tom Loftus, since we have a little bit of extra time, did you want to go over your uh, portfolio review? I, I can if you want. Um, Were you prepared to do that this sure. month or do you yep. want to do it next month? Yeah, I was. I'll make but it's, very, it's very short, okay. I'll make you presenter. Uh, probably I took Tom's time. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Mina, what do you think of a uh, Domino's pizza? Do you want to buy more or do you want to sell? Well, so uh, the uh, I, I know it seems to be listed for this month's meeting, but I think that's an error because the recording is um, reporting their quarterly earnings in July. So I think we'll have oh, a better okay. time. So it was then, a mistake but, then. But honestly, based on everything so far, I, I would probably be more enticed to get up to the 3% than to get rid of the 2.7 that we have. Mm. Um, because it does seem to be a good opportunity and i mean we don't have to buy very much to get up to the threshold i think but um i think we can save that i think at this point maybe that conversation better next month but happy to to go into it today too yeah another thing is they could increase i mean the price can go up more and get to three percent right that's right. the other yeah. we're at 2.7 right now so it's uh right okay okay so we started off with the pert report and then we done the screens to, um, to to make to fill in the in the chart that um, Mike Torberson made. Uh, this is the the Excel the way the Excel sheet looks. If anyone's interested, we could share this with them. But it looks a little more uh, different. So when you look at um, Algonquin, you can see the 
the, the different areas, or if you look at some of these stocks like uh, Walt Disney, where they have a couple of areas where they're they're weakened. But uh, as a summary for the portfolio review, things that were recommended by look, looking at uh, this portfolio review is Algonquin. It's still um, in the buy. Uh, I confirmed like Bernie's uh, first American was a was a good choice. And then Vertex, because it dropped thirty dollars, we and we've talked about it. And then Comcast um, and Charles Schwab. Um, so Comcast, we're waiting for Hanny's presentation there to confirm that. And then Charles Schwab, Jay and um, and Chris commented on Jan's um, Schwab uh, and increase Jan's uh, pre um, his presentation a little bit. Um, and then the total return, we last month we were at 10.4% and it's increased. I guess part of it is some of the shuffling with the the cash, but mostly it's there's about half the stocks are down a little bit from last month, and then mm. some of putting in some additional uh, like Amazon there um, and uh, eBay has in, improved our total return. So that was my presentation. Hmm. Do we? Uh, how many people have a Comcast? Do we? Really, somebody really has has Comcast. Can we really look at our work, each of us offline? Look at the club portfolio to see again what you have, what you don't. If we don't have, then we don't have to follow it. And and can I just say that um, Algonquin and Vertex, we have um, it's over the six whatever, 6%, six percent, six. And first uh, American is only at like 3%. So that out of the three buys, I would suggest considering the FAF. Can and we take a look at, didn't Bernard send us the SSG? Yeah. yeah. Send us, can we take a look? Because I was just, you know, I know he's not here, but at least um, Isla presented FAF can chime in with, this number. Do you have that, um, uh, Joanne? Yeah, I, I'll take the screen. And it's okay. it's down five dollars from last last month. Wait, say that again. It was sixty six uh, fifty eight last month. It's sixty one sixty four on Friday. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. They'll probably be reporting next month also. Oh, do you see my? Yeah, yeah. You don't have a live one. Well, then I have to import the ITK. So I think a live one better. I would like. Yeah, to see but some trends. Okay. Discuss oh, but, but, but um, I love just saying that the report comes out next month. Can we wait till next month? I think we should. What? Wait till next should, month. What? Yeah, uh, to talking? do the quarterly review, to do the quarterly evaluation before we decide to buy FAF. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He his first cut. I mean, his uh, PERT report isn't in here either. So. Oh. Okay. So we'll just add it to the agenda for next meeting then. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I think that's it. So, it, any motions for uh, iRobot? Oh, how much? How much? How much of a? Um, hmm. We have two thousand dollars cash. Let's go. Thousand dollars. Okay. And are we also, adding a thousand every meeting again? Yes. Oh, okay. actually, we made a proposal to. We are thinking because one thousand sometimes have remainders. So it depends on how many members we have. We are thinking of to how much was it uh, ready? Was a hundred dollars each person? Huh? We want to have a fixed number of uh, contributions. Oh well, the, um, I what thought you were going to. I can't remember. We still need to vote on it. We have not decided. Yes, but to answer your question, Megumi, right now, yes, we. I, uh, I suggested. Uh, uh, that each member each month have a fixed amount 
number of members may change 16 right now 16 if it is 10 10 100 dollars per member thousand if it is 16 1600 i think that should be the way not a fixed amount for each month total okay amount. okay so already do you uh, want to make a motion uh do, do, do you want yeah. to present the all the changes you, you, you're doing yeah i don't even know what we that's how we were um okay otherwise okay i will propose a motion um going forward from this month my motion is proposal is uh, sub, subscribe or contribute each member a fixed amount i suggest hundred dollars per month for each member active member of the club Mm. Okay, sounds good. So, Jing second? It was that Jing yeah. or Mikini? Yeah, yeah, I second. Open for discussion. Yeah. Do you have any concerns, uh, Megumi? Oh, no, I just didn't know. Um, well, we had a hard time spending a thousand a month. <laughs> well, what, what are we at now? Sixteen <laughs> hundred. Oh, that, but that's uh, fine. It's funny money, so just we're gonna have to make more of a concerted effort not to let our cash portion grow. And I, I, I think that we'll have to make a conscious effort also to repurchase stocks that we already own in the portfolio. Yeah. We're gonna get the three percent rule and the maximum ownership as well. We'll have to. I have to find a good balance there while maintaining a number of companies that's actually realistic for the company to uh, for the, for the mm -hmm. club to follow. So, if we think sixteen hundred would create a like, are we worried that it will create too much of a cash glut like we had prior to the payout? We're adding sixteen, are we confident we'll maybe be or or alternatively, are we going to become more aggressive at purchasing? Uh, I have a response. In five years, uh, this club has good good size uh, membership. Uh, our total is uh, what uh, some sixty thousand. I think uh, there is no if the ten members thousand uh, dollars per month are um, sixteen members six hundred dollars not a big big deal. We should be able to do more active research and buy the companies. Actually, we have fifty. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we have 16 members. We can have right. We have, we have yeah, right now 16, 16 to 20 stocks. Well, while maintaining three percent ownership of a three percent representation, I think that's just my concern is to make sure we get up to three percent. If we're buying, we'll have to increase the purchases, or we'll have to consider that at least when buying. And I'm I'm just worried that we did get to a point where we did have such a such a cash reserve, and mm. that's because I think correctly we were making wise and maybe conservative decisions in our investing but um i'm just assuming if that trend follows i, I just don't want to stand up with too much cash again that's all because we get we make zero we're not even we're not accounting for cash which is like zero return right negative in fact right I, we, mm -hmm. we, we have we have a few stocks uh, uh, with the two or three percent increase them to five percent I'm not seeing a real problem here. There are so many good companies, but. Well, so do we just want to vote? Mm -hmm. <laughs> are we ready to vote or do you want more discussion? We can, we can vote. Because you can Let's always. Vote. I mean, it's all like not real money, right? So. I know, but we cannot think of that way. Yeah. So what is all the buyout and stuff? Like, this is the first I've heard of it. How come? Um... Oh, yeah, payout. So yeah, payout. if yeah. it's in a real club, um, McGuin, if it's a real club, um, so when you leave the club, you will take the either profit or loss. So mostly in betting investing clubs that you will take the profit. So Tom Jones joined back 2016 from the beginning. His share is about 17%. Uh, so because he he left the company, so based on his uh, share, 
that's what we gave him 17 percent of our thing we did not practice that way so there are three members left roy andrew and uh, john dennis we did mm -hmm. not give them the share but what we did is we only took out their contribution going forward we will for example uh gabe he just had his second baby he wants to focus on his family so his share, I forgot how much was a uh, Gabe's share because he didn't join us very long, right? Let's just say mm -hmm. he has two percent. So we have to give him two percent of his share. If we have cash, we will we'll, we'll give him cash. Ideally, okay. in real club, if you don't have cash, you need to ask that person. Okay, do you want a stock? We can transfer stock to you, or we can sell it and give him cash. Uh, because mm -hmm. we are a hypothetical club, we're thinking to raise money, just give him the cash. I see. Okay. Yeah, okay. This, this, this is the procedure followed in the clubs with the active subscription of the monthly money. Right. Hmm. We did not do it initially because we we did not catch the mistake we just yeah so now when i was looking into give tom payout and i was like we correct a lot of uh redistribution we noticed the distribution was not evenly distributed among members mm. so now is much more representative more much more like real club real money club so it's a good thing we had a lot of cash <laughs> yes so we didn't have we didn't have to sell any shares to get that right. money. Yes. Right. Okay. yes. All right. All right. But that and also just... solved our problem, our concern, because our concern is just too much cash. Now explain to us why we have so much cash, because we did not give to the people right. that left. The right. Club. Which and, would have happened if we were an, uh, an actual money club. Right. Yes. So one of the proposals is that when a a member leaves that we raise cash amongst the members rather than selling stock if we don't have enough cash on hand. Or bring on a new member, probably. No? What do you mean? Like if, if somebody leaves and somebody takes their place? Like a buy-in? Like, yeah. Well, you'll have to pay them out. Yeah, for example, yeah, make sure yeah, yeah, okay. no matter what. Yeah. Let's see, Gabe, Gabe was share. How much is Gabe is only like 1%. 0.96, so we just gave him 1% of like 30 units of worth of stock. Do you think it'd be an interesting exercise and not just simply always raise, raising cash? What if we had a cap on the amount of cash that we were willing to, you know, uh, hypothetically raise when we're buying somebody out so that it, I don't know, it could create some interesting questions and um, debates amongst what what could be cashed out when yeah, we could sell stock. Yeah, I mean that's what other clubs. I mean, real money clubs do. Mm -hmm. He can, he can, he can uh, address some of those issues in a couple of ways. One, a member who intends to leave, at least give one month advance notice, and he can be paid one month later, following month. So that way you get two months warning. Yeah, yeah, some sort of notice per provision would also could also yeah. be um, provision to notify and uh, uh, pay next month, not not this month, right away. So maybe we should table this conversation until we're offline, and we can maybe set up a committee, or we can get a group. The executive can get together, and we can maybe discuss some proposals for next time, just for the sake of our guests. Yes, That's good. Okay, so do we have a mentor this? Uh, what, what, what's the reason for tabling? Oh, uh, just simply for the guests. I mean, this is more of an administrative organizational point. So I think it makes sense that we can have this conversation in a, in a separate No, meeting. this is not administrative. Each member has a, a vote here. Any proposal? Oh, I, I agree that they have a, a vote. I'm, I'm but for stuck. some of us, it's the yeah. first we've heard of it. Yeah. Right. So we can put some suggestions. They need a the process. They need a time. Yeah. They need a time to process. We don't have time. to make a decision right now. Right. Yeah. I will leave that to pre President. Okay. Uh, <laughs> do we have a mentor this uh, meeting, Jay? Oh, actually, suppose as a Harry, but I thought we just had 
he told he cannot make it tonight and he said oh. we're doing great okay good so we need, a, we, we need a new mentor i can look for next one for next carol time. fine and then um next stock stud next month we have uh mina jay and narinda narinda is a a guest that wants to uh participate in the stock study can I make a comment? You guys probably wondering how come my names again. So we <laughs> made a stock study because I just did a stock study. I did it. I participated. I did not present. I would like to do it again. Two reasons. One <laughs> is we made us at the beginning, first of five years, the VP assigned who pairs with who doing stock studies. We decided right now to do something different. We want the members to volunteer to sign up who you want to stock study with. Uh, what month are you available most likely for me like a summer uh, uh, during the break so another thing is i have not done any stock studies with mina so mina and i want to do stock study together definitely a dream team yes. if you will. right so <laughs> that's why my name showed up again <laughs> i that's not fair because i just did one i will do a presentation next time i don't think anybody was complaining <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> You can do it every month, Jay. Yeah, right. you, can take, you can take my you can take my spots too. That's so weird, because like, other clubs, everybody yeah. wants stock studies. You so you guys don't want to do stock studies. We'll volunteer you. Yeah, <laughs> I like the stock studies. I I'll feel comfortable when I do myself. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So Mina and I, and um, you guys can look up the sheet. Just put your name down. For the month you want to stock study with you what month are you available that's just something we're trying new we want and to practice think, intrinsic motivation mm -hmm. and i think for just for next meeting as well maybe we should also add time on the agenda to discuss um well i mean i, I know we voted on the issue but um discuss the issue of how we're going to allocate buyouts and we'll do the the payouts and all that maybe we should build some time into the meeting next time as well that's a good idea Okay. Or just send us like a, an email explaining well, what yeah, the we're... proposal. Proposal, yeah. And then the we can vote on it. Yeah. The reason, the reason yeah. I propose we should table it is so that we can put together maybe like a cogent a, a, a outline of a proposal for the members to review by email, and yeah. then by the time the next meeting rolls around, people can have points for discussion, pros or cons, and then then we can vote a little bit more informed. Um, right. That's okay. that's that would the only. Be great. Thing. Yep. That sounds good. Okay. So well, do we have a motion for this time? For any I stocks? Are we buying um um I I robot or I make a motion to buy uh how much we have a two thousand? Uh two thousand round number two thousand. Okay, yeah. so it's a hundred dollars a share right now? Almost. Okay, so I can make a motion to buy ten ten shares. Uh one thousand dollars of it. I second. A thousand dollars? Yes. Yes. Let's... We can open discussion. Yes, the motion is 1,000, but Joanne, what's your concern? Why 1,000? We can spend 2,000. Spend them all? Yes. Because uh -oh. I tried uh -oh. to leave room. For... Yeah, go ahead, Isla. <laughs> I'm never a fan of spending all of the money at one time. Right. Um, but are, are, we gonna, are we gonna have more money after this meeting oh no 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 when you think about the percentage yeah. you're right yes the percentage is also we are going to put the, we are going to put at least thousand dollars or uh, sixteen hundred dollars so let me ask meeting. you this already all right so how much would the percentage be right, right. basically that's why i have to think about it so mm. the accounting so do we buy uj two thousand in our post motion or do we buy one thousand i can't remember in the past, our motions when we buy stocks. Well, we were doing a thousand traditionally, but then once we became cash rich, we started doing I, two, and three, four thousand. Oh, pretty yeah. aggressive. I proposed, huh? I, proposed okay. a, I proposed an amendment to two thousand. Two thousand. Two thousand bring us to three point two percent. Only oh, okay. Okay. I really think that this is a good company. Um, it's a medium-sized company, have a lot of growth, and um. I hope that they will expand, you know, not in just vacuum cleaning. And not just cleaning the floor. Not just cleaning the floor, yeah. 
They have a bunch. They have lots and lots of patents. They have lots and lots of models of things that they've tried. And I think their runway for doing other things is good once they get their um, build facilities hooked up in Malaysia. I think they'll be ready to move forward with that kind of stuff. Yeah, the price you guys probably noticed the drop sharply. The 52 weeks high is about almost $200, right? 197 right now is at the 95. It was mm. because of tariff. It was not because company's performance. It was because of what? The tariff with China. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I have Mina making the motion. Did anybody a motion to buy 2,000 of iRobot? Did anybody second? I'll second. Several I'll... people will second. <laughs> yeah. Good company. Are we still yeah, give us 24 hours to vote? We don't have to vote at this moment, right, Joanne? You don't have to vote. But once a simple majority is reached, um, oh, okay. It, but you'll get an email if it's uh, okay. Does anybody own this stock, or I do? Okay. Um, are we ready to adjourn? We can adjourn early and then uh, get our guests on. It's yeah. not fair, right, Adam. You think I'm biased, right? Because I own the stock. No, I, it's good because that's <laughs> more interesting in kind of knowing what's happening. When did you buy the stock, Jay? After the stock study? Or yes. before? Okay, that's good. <laughs> that's oh, great. Okay. Now we don't have to yeah. ask if anybody owns it. We know it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I bought it, I bought it right thing. away. The price we, don't have, we don't have to beg buy anybody it. to buy it. That's so good. Yeah. So good. So good. Yeah, that's a good endorsement. Okay. Yeah. I want, yeah. I want to know if Matt's still going to stay on because we have questions from the guests about Matt's presentation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Matt, are you going to stay on? We could, so we can adjourn the meeting. Uh, yeah, I can stay on for like 15 more minutes. Okay. Is there any oh. last any last member questions and concerns issues to be raised before we adjourn? I'll be vacationing on in July, so I miss one meeting. Okay. okay. Have fun. Oh, lucky. Thanks. Have fun. Hope it's more warm. Yeah. Okay, other than that, I think we're going to end the recording now. Uh, stop recording.